This lesson deals with the step response of a second order differential equation. You can find these notes in the ECE 201 ebook in chapter 7 starting on page 53. Suppose that we have a series RLC circuit made of one inductance, one capacitance, and then lots of resistances, DC sources, and a switch. Let's thevenize that part of the circuit after the switch changes state. We'll also have two initial conditions, one with the voltage across the capacitance and the current through the inductance. As we'd seen with the first order differential equation, any voltage or any current was the sum of a natural response and the force response. This is true for any voltage or any current in this circuit too. So the form of our solution for any voltage or any current is going to be what we had for our natural response, and then we're going to add a force response in, in this case a DC result. Well, the reason this works is that the voltage or current in your circuit is related to the voltage and currents of the inductance and the capacitance, either by a scalar or by a derivative or an integral. That doesn't change the form of the solution. So in the overdam case, we had S1 and S2 as real numbers, and now we're going to add a DC result to this. For the critically damped case, we had S1 equal to S2, and this was a different form of the solution. And lastly, for the underdamped case, we had that alpha was less than omega naught. We have the same form of the solution, it's going to add a DC result. Let's take a look at an example. The series RLC circuit in a single switch, 48 volt battery, resistor of 280 ohms, an inductance of 100 millihenries, and a capacitor of 0.4 microfarads. If the switch open, there's no current flowing in the circuit, so our initial condition for the inductance will be zero. And likewise, since we haven't connected anything, the voltage across here would just be that of a fresh capacitor, which would be zero. Assume the switch closes at t equals zero, and let's calculate the solution, say the voltage across the capacitance. Let's figure out which form of the solution we need to pick. The value of alpha for their series circuit was R Thevenin over 2L, and that turns out to be 1.4 kiloradians per second. Omega is the square root of 1 over LC, and that's 5 kiloradians per second. So here again we have alpha less than omega naught, so that's our underdamped case. Let's calculate the damped radian frequency as the difference of omega naught squared and alpha squared. And that turns out to be 4.8 kiloradians per second. So the form of the solution for any voltage or any current in our circuit is of the form C1 e to the minus alpha t cosine omega d times t plus theta plus a3. So there's five unknowns here. Alpha and omega d are determined by the component values in our circuit, and we already know those. And then we have three remaining unknowns, C1, theta, and A3. So we'll need three equations to solve for these three unknowns. Well, the voltage across the capacitance cannot change instantaneously. Since it was equal to zero at zero minus, we can then take our equation and evaluate it at zero plus and be able to solve for some of our constants. So plugging in t equals zero here, we have C1 e to the zero, which is one, cosine of zero plus theta plus A3. Here are three constants, and that expression needs to equal zero. We need two more equations. Take the derivative of the capacitor voltage. That's also related to the capacitor current divided by the capacitance. The current in the capacitor is also the current in the inductor. The value at zero minus is the same as zero plus. It's equal to zero. Let's differentiate this equation, and then we'll set t equal to zero. We've got a product of two functions of time. We're going to use the product rule. The derivative of the first term is going to be minus alpha, e to the minus alpha t times c1, and then times the cosine omega dt plus theta. And we'll take the derivative of this, which is equal to minus the sine of omega dt plus theta. And then we're going to take the derivative of what's inside here, which is just equal to omega d with respect to t. And then we multiply that by c1 e to the minus alpha t. The derivative of a constant is just equal to zero. Plugging in zero then, we have minus alpha c1 e to the zero is one, cosine of zero plus theta. C1 e to the zero, which is one, omega d sine of zero plus theta. So here's our second equation in our unknowns. We know the value of alpha, and we know the value of omega d, but this has to equal zero. So we can divide through by C1, and now we're left with just theta. So this term here has to equal the negative of this term. So let's put this on the other side of the equation. Let's solve for theta. Let's divide the sine by the cosine, and then bring this term over here. So I have minus 1.4k divided by 4.8k. That's a minus 0.292. Take the arc tangent of that. It turns out to be 16.26 degrees. I've got the value of theta now. I need a third equation. I could take a look at steady state. 
long enough, the capacitance will look like an open circuit and the inductance a short circuit. So if we do that, let's go back and look at our circuit and see what we get. The switch is closed. We're going to open circuit this and we're going to short circuit this. With the open circuit and the switch closed, we have no current flowing. And so there's no drop across here, no drop across the short. So the voltage across here is the same as the battery. Value, if we wait long enough, is equal to 48 volts. Now let's go back and look at our equation. So as T approaches infinity, this term gets smaller and smaller, and all we're left with is just A3. The value of A3 then is equal to 48 volts. Go back to our first equation, C1 cosine of theta plus A3 is equal to zero. We can now solve for C1. So minus A3 divided by the cosine of theta, 48 cosine of minus 16.26 degrees, get minus 50. So now our solution then is C1, which is minus 50, e to the minus alpha, which is 1.4 k times t, cosine of 4.8 kiloradians per second times t, and the angle is minus 16.26 degrees, and then plus 48 volts. Well, let's write this as the reciprocal of 714 microseconds, and then we can interpret this in terms of five time constants. Let's pull out 2 pi here, and then we'll have the frequency in hertz, and then the reciprocal of this would be the period. Now the voltage across the capacitance cannot change instantaneously. The value for t less than zero was zero, and for t greater than zero, as we cross through zero, must also be zero. So if you take t equals zero here, you get minus 50 times one times the cosine of zero, minus 16.26 plus 48. Minus 50 times the cosine of minus 16.26 turns out to be minus 48 volts. So we get zero at t equals zero. So we have continuity at t equals zero. Take a look at running this on spice. Again, there's a switch built in at t equals zero. I'm just going to give it now the values of the initial conditions in our problem. So I had no current for the inductance and no voltage for the capacitance. This will be our step response. So I got my voltage source between nodes 1 and 0, 48 volts. The resistor between 1 and 2, 280. The inductor between 2 and 3 is 100 millihenries. And the capacitance between 3 and 0 is 0.4 microfarads. We have the same time frame again here that we did before. Maybe before we look at the solution, let's take a look at what we might expect the uh, value to be. So five times this is when this term will die out. So a little bit less than five milliseconds. Here's node voltage one. You can see it equals zero plus it jumps from zero to 48 volts. And here's the voltage across the capacitance. You can see here there's an exponential envelope. So we're calling the damping factor. So one over the time constant is that damping factor. We've got a frequency to this sinusoid. Take from peak to peak here, and to take the reciprocal of that, you get 4.8 kiloradians per second. So that's the same as what we calculated. Five time constants would be about 3.57 milliseconds, and we went out to five, and you can see clearly this has reached a steady state value here of 48. We could also look at other voltages and currents in our circuit. Here's a plot of the voltage across the inductance. You can see it starts out at 48 volts, and again has this decaying exponential, and settles out at about five time constants. What if we had other types of forcing functions? Suppose we had a sinusoid. Well, then the form of our solution would again be the natural response plus the force response. So if you put a sinusoid in, you're going to see that that sinusoid is going to have a different magnitude and a different angle as it's interacting with our circuit. I'm going to add this again to each of the natural responses. The force response we found with a DC result, but they're treating a capacitance like an open circuit and inductance like a short circuit. We'll take a look at in the beginning of ECE 202 in chapter eight is how to find this force response in what's called a phasor analysis. Once you find that, we can then add that to this result and then solve for the remaining constants. What if you had a parallel RLC circuit? Again, what we would have is one inductance, one capacitance, and initial conditions associated with them, and then we'd have a a circuit with many sources, DC in this case, resistances and a switch, and after the switch changes state, we could Nortonize the equivalent circuit. And any voltage or any current in this circuit would be of the same form. If we have a forcing function that's DC, we'll have resulting output that's DC. And these were the values of alpha and omega naught and omega D we had found in the parallel case. And so the methodology is the same as the series case we just looked at. And then likewise, if we had a sinusoidal input, we then any voltage or any current in our circuit would be some combination of that sinusoid. So then once we could find these quantities, we'll do this in 
again, chapter eight of ECE 202. We can solve for the remaining constants in our three different cases of overdamped, critically damped, and underdamped. This is how we'll solve for the step response of a second order differential equation.